So my name is Christine Kelly Sanchez and I am the Miami, Florida Chambonnet Center of Excellence Associate Director and the European European Studies Program at the Value Associate Director as well. I am pleased to welcome you today to this presentation on the dark cloud, a comparison of US-EU policy on critical materials for the digital economy. Today's presentation is on Mr. Guillaume Pitro recently published book, The Dark Cloud, Dark how, cloud. Dark United cloud. States, published in the United States. Yes. <laughs> how the online world is costing the hearse. The discussion will focus on the origin, origins of digital technology and the disastrous effect on the finite amount of our planet resources used to support it, which creates consequences for our environment. He will compare US-EU policy on critical materials for the digital economy, the geopolitics of extracting the raw materials, and reflects on Europe's energy sovereignty and the happy bills caused by artificial intelligence. They were singing 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before we begin, I would like to thank the French Embassy in Washington, D.C., the Consulate General of France in Miami, Villa Albertine, Mr. Anthony Dominguez, a cultural attaché uh, at the Consulate General of France and Villa Albertine, by bringing Mr. Pitron uh, to Miami and FIU. Our partners at Florida International University, the Stephen J. Green School of International Public Affairs, the European and Eurasian Studies Program, the Politics and International Relations, our professor, Dr. Asida Arras, uh, the College of Law, and I want sincerely to thank Mr. Pietro uh, to be here today and for speaking to us. It's really, we are really uh, uh, proud of having you with us. And now I would like to tell you a little bit of Mr. Pietro. Very fast, so it's really important. Yeah. Mr. Guillaume Pietro is a French journalist, author and filmmaker. His work includes studies on environmental, economic, and geopolitical ramifications of new technology. He has written two books, and both address the natural resources needed to keep creating new technology. The Dark Cloud, here, how the digital world is costing the earth, and the rare metal world. His media appearances include interviews in both French and international media, Le Figaro, BBC World Services, Bloomberg TV, El País, and La Repubblica. And his speaking engagements have included many international fora and institutions, Davos, IMF, European Commission, UNESCO. He holds a postgraduate degree from the University of Paris, a master degree in law from Georgetown University. And now, without any further ado, here is Mr. Pitron. Thank you. So I speak with the micro, right? We, we listen, we hear each other very well. Thank you very much, Christine Kelly, for introducing me. The last time I spoke in university, actually I didn't speak, I was sitting in this room, but I was at your place. That was 20 years ago in DC. That's very nice for me to be actually speaking uh, for this course. Uh, I didn't want to be a lawyer, I changed my career after that, I went to work at National Geographic in DC and then became a reporter, and for the last 15 years I've been working as a reporter, and what I like in this work is to be on the field, to be like a venturer, and to work on many resources, and one of the most fascinating issues I've been working on is the issue of critical minerals, both for the energy transition, I wrote the first book, which was published in the United States uh, three, four years ago, The Rare Metals War, and the second is The Dark Cloud, and I'm going to mix a bit my findings from both books in this 45 minute lecture that I'm going to introduce you to, I'm going to try to make you as interested as possible in these topics because these are fascinating topics and we're going to speak about what I'm going to speak to you about for the next 20 years or 30 years or so, or so for sure. Uh, let me start just by uh, reminding you that we live in an IT world, everyone knows that, and turning virtual rather than being in the physical world doing something in the virtual world, sending an email rather than sending an envelope to your grandmother for saying hi, is much better for the environment. That's very true. 
you have much less impact on the environment if you do live in many respects in the future world. And this has been confirmed by many studies which have been offered to the public for the last years, either by UNESCO or other UN agencies, saying if you turn online, if you do what you have to do in the virtual world, if you put your data in the cloud, or if you dematerialize, that's going to be better for the environment. The thing is, this uh, message, this narrative, mixing, turning virtual with actually being less uh, impactful in the environment, has been challenged. That was a couple of years ago by a European think tank, whose name it is uh, the Shift Project. And the Shift Project, that was back in 2019, comes with the reverse findings, that actually if we turn online, if we turn virtual, actually the impact on the environment is worse than if we were doing anything in the physical world. So there is a debate which has been growing for the last years, especially in Europe, probably less in the United States, maybe it's growing in the United States too, about whether, you know, whatever you do online, but uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, chat GPT, uh, 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 buying non-fungible tokens, sending emails, watching videos, is it better to actually be online or is it better to actually do some stuff in the physical world? And that's impossible to answer this question. It's just too difficult. Obviously, some things are good for the environment if you just keep them being online. No paper at all. You don't have to print anymore. On the other hand, the explosion of the needs for the digital world and the explosion of AI, of generative AI, may have huge impacts on the planet. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And we need to take that into consideration. So I can't answer the question whether IT for us green is one thing, does green IT exist? Probably not. And what is the balance between both? I have no idea. I can just tell you that the growing environmental impact, the growing energy impact of this IT technologies on the environment is something which is getting very important, especially, especially in the face of fighting against climate change. But let me start by talking to you about the minerals that are used for the digital world. 80%, 70, 80% of the impacts for the planet of the IT is due to the extraction of the resource that are needed for the IT world. Resource in the servers, resource in the data centers, cables, satellites, but also resource in the phones that you have in your pocket. And you may not know that, but you have 50 metals in your pocket. Your phone is an amazing, complex technology, a wonderful technology, but which is made of so many resources, which I can name a bit. Uh, for example, for the battery, you need lithium and cobalt but you need copper, plastic, tin, gold. You need that strange, that strange metal. You need neodymium in your phone. You don't even know what neodymium is, I guess, right? Well, with the neodymium, your phone is uh, actually vibrating and not ringing. Uh, because you have put your phone in a vibrating mode, there is a magnet which is made of several metals, including the neodymium. And this neodymium keeps you silent for at least 45 minutes. Thank you very much for that. But you don't even know its existence. You don't know the existence of a metal whose name is indium. I-N-D-I-U-M. Indium has changed your life, and you don't know that. Because actually the indium makes your phone tactile. So a few micrograms of this powder of indium on the screen of your phone makes the phone tactile. And that changed your life. You may be too young to remember what was the age of before indium. That was an age where I had to, you know, send, it would take me two minutes to send an SMS, a text message. Because I had to type literally on the hard touches of my screen, or of my phone. But the Indian changes everything, and no one really knows about it. But it is needs to be taken out from the ground from somewhere. So we can multiply the examples of such resources. And what I'm talking to you about the phones, the, the resource in your phone, is just a tip of the iceberg. Because you need, actually, to get much more than that in order to make your phone possible. To make your phone, you have to move some earth. You have to separate the ore from the metal. You have to use water in order to refine the metal. You have to use electricity to transport the metal from one side of the earth to the other side of the earth. So what you don't see is the hidden face of the iceberg is all the resources that indirectly come into the processing of the resources of your phone, which is on the top of the iceberg. Your phone is like what? 150 grams? In reality, you need 1,200 more times resources than the final weight, than the final weight of the product. So you need 183, you know, on average, kilograms of resource to make a 150 gram phone possible. This is a something that we don't see. This is a, obviously is a, the dark side of, of uh, the, the hidden side of the iceberg 
that you need to take into consideration. So it's much more impactful for the environment, it's much more physically impactful to actually make these phones possible than what you think when you just you know, take your phone and think, oh, it's a light object, so everything might be limited in terms of environmental impact. It's not true. So if we have to summarize in a couple of figures, what percentage of the world production of copper resources which are directly featured into your phone, you see it's not a few percentages. It may be a very important amount of the extraction, world extraction of these resources, which is being needed for various applications of your IT everyday life. From 40, 60, 50, 70, sometimes 80 percent of various resources for living online. And we have no real understanding of that. Copper is such an important metal, so important. Thanks to copper, you make batteries, but you also make electric cars. You make many, many everyday products with copper. It's said to become one of the most important resources to be extracted from the, from the ground for the next 30 years. We're going to extract more copper in the next 30 years than all the copper the human can has extracted for the last 70,000 years. Because we so much need this copper, including for batteries of phones. No, don't forget that such a copper comes among other sources from Chile. This is the biggest open pit copper mine in the world, taking place in the north of Chile, as I showed before, in Chuquicamata. And obviously, this has impacts. And this has three scopes of impacts. And I'm going to be very quick on that to make you understand. The first scope is the direct GHG emission. We call this a scope one. Well, obviously, a mine truck consumes up to 100 liters of fuel, per hour, so this emits direct CO2 emissions from the mine. So that's the first perimeter. But the second perimeter is an indirect GHG emission related to the electricity, the electricity use of the mine. Because where does the electricity come from to refine the metals? So you have to look at the Chilean electricity mix. And in Chile, 40% of the electricity comes from coal. So you have to take into consideration in the scope two actually the emissions of CO2 coming from the electricity power plants, which is a coal power plant in most of the cases, in 40% of the cases. And the scope three is other GHG indirect emissions. You need to, we need water in Chile to refine the, the, the metal. But where does the water come from? Well, we are in the desert, we are in the Atacama Desert. So more and more of the water comes from the Pacific Ocean. But it needs to be desalinized in a desalinization power plant on the edge of the Pacific, where does the electricity come from for desalinizing the water that makes possible to refine the copper which is in your phone? So this is a very indirect effect. And once again, we go back to actually so electricity power plants. And we figured out in a documentary where does the coal for the electricity power plant come from? And we figured out that the coal comes from Colombia and New Zealand with impacts out there. So this is a scope three. So if we take into consideration these three impacts, well, you see that the GHG emissions may come from different places, either the mine itself or different areas around the mine, which need to be taken into consideration, and which makes you understand that all the IT world amounts for about 4% of GHG emissions around the world, 4%. All the planes, all the civil planes, the commercial planes, it's 2.4. The IT world is 4%. It may become 8 or 10% at this pace of development because we live more and more in the IT world. All these resources, we don't know more, much more about it because actually, if you look at this very interesting uh, graph, it shows the share of the production of such resources worldwide for the last 150 years. And the red, uh, well, let's start with the United States, which is in light blue. As you see, the United States used to play an important role in the extraction of these resources until the 40s. And then today, the United States is not for 5% of the world extraction of resources, of mining resources. But obviously, the United States exploit, I mean, uh, uh, consumes much more than this 5%. It consumes maybe 20, 25%, but it only extracts 5%. And Europe is red, and we in Europe, we don't extract much too. We extract 3%, but we need 22%. So what's been ha happening is that all the mines, which used to be much more in the Western world, have been moved to the developing world. We in the West, we don't want to be dirty. We just say, okay, 
we're going to close the mine, or we're not going to open a new mine, which we, should, which we should open because we need this metal for our energy needs and for our IT needs. We're going to let other countries, Chile, Peru, Brazil, in, in green, but also uh, former USSR bloc countries, including uh, Ukraine and Russia, uh, but also China, extract these resources. So we have, in a way, outsourced the pollution, the mining pollution of the resources for the IT world. And we have let other countries do the job, do the dirty job. And we can have a phone in our hand, in our hand and say, oh, I'm turning virtual. I have a dematerialized life. I'm going to put my paycheck in the cloud. But everything comes at a physical cost. Everything comes at a, at, a, at a GHG cost. We just don't see it because we don't have a mine in our backyard. Very few mines. We'll get back to that. But just to make you understand that it's hard to understand the invisible cost of the mining where the mining doesn't take place in our countries in the Western world. And that brings us to this fascinating map. This map tells us where do, which countries do produce the resource for the IT world. And if we look at the countries producing most of these resources, we see Chile, we talked about copper, but we see also a bit of the United States for beryllium, which is used for defense technologies. We see the Democratic Republic of Congo for cobalt. I think many of you have understood, have known about uh, you know, the extraction of cobalt, sometimes artisanal mining in the RC. Cobalt is used in your fault. You all have a couple of grams, six to nine grams of cobalt in your pocket, in the battery of your phone. And much of this cobalt comes from the RC, from the south of the RC. But also South Africa, Russia, Australia, and especially China. And China is the today is the world leading country in the extraction and the processing of the resources that are needed for the IT world. We are dependent for much of our metals need from China. And that is an issue. And I took the latest uh, declaration that I could find from a US uh, official, which just dates back to the last week. But obviously, it said that critical minerals are one of the pieces of the supply chain that we're very concerned about uh, in the United States. And we do not want to be over-reliant on resources of countries whose values we may not share. And actually, uh, the US Secretary of State is specifically speaking about China. She also says, we feel very strongly that both extraction and processing of those critical minerals have to be addressed either by the United States or our allies. And she also says, and that's why we're working very closely to ensure that we have identified which raw materials or critical minerals we need to be able to do our transition to a clean energy economy. I could add an IT economy, but that's also the same resources that are needed for the clean transition. So there are huge needs coming today in the world. The United States are going to be part of these huge needs. And the question is, where are we going to get these resources in a world where, once again, most of these resources are being extracted by other countries and ours, which poses a dependency issue, a sovereignty issue. So many things have been uh, put under the carpet for many years. I've been working on this issue for the last 15 years. I've been coming to report in the United States for the last 15 years on this issue. And I can tell you, nothing has been done. But things started to change a couple of years ago. And it has started to change because many things happened recently. There was a COVID. Do you remember at the very beginning of the COVID, where were the masks? They were in China. They were not in Europe. They were not in the United States. I remember my, my mother suing, uh, making her own mask because we had no way to, to find them. And so that made us realize that for some very specific, uh, strategic, critical resources, such as a mask, we were just completely reliant over China. And China was, do you remember, spreading their masks everywhere in a, mind, in, a, in a mask diplomacy to let the world know that they were taking care of the others. But also, what happened is, as you may remember, in the Suez Canal, that was back in 2021, there was an evergreen like this uh, 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 container uh, shipping, which, was, which blocked the canal for about 10 days. And so people say, oh my goodness, if there's one part of the logistic process which actually is missing, if something is going wrong, we just have to wait for days and days before we can get something out of the supply chain, which is a worldwide supply chain. So we do understand certainly that we may be in a difficult situation. And the last thing is something that touches you less, but it touches us a lot in Europe, which is the Ukraine war. 
and many countries in France, in, in Europe, including uh, especially in Germany, have been very dependent, reliant, on the gas from Russia. And from one day to one another, Russia said, well, I'm going to stop you know, export, exporting my gas to you guys in Europe. And gas, we were so much reliant on this gas from Russia. So we have understood that we have changed worlds. We have changed paradigms. For a while, globalization was understood as being a world where every resource would be available to everyone, whatever the cost. We would just have to pay, we would get these resources. Someone would actually, uh, we would subcontract the resource extraction and processing to someone who would, at a low price, because that was in the developing world, they would produce the resources, and we would get these resources by, by any way or whatever. That was, the easy, that was, and that still is, the invisible hands of the markets. That was, and that still is, a bit happy globalization. We get the best in the developed world, while the resources from the developing world are being processed. And actually, we can just make sure that thanks to globalization, we're going to get these resources. But that changes, this situation is changing now. And it's changing because actually, we understand that countries which have these resources want to actually play a political game, a geopolitical game. They are starting to say, hmm, maybe I'm going to keep the resources for my own development. Maybe I'm going just to stop export, exporting the gas in a situation of war. And we have seen these situations multiply for the last decades. And we have seen for the last two decades China saying, I have these critical minerals for my, for going, for going from my, from my ground, but I'm going to keep them for my own development. So you won't get all these beautiful lithium and rare earths, which is a type of a family of resource, and other resources, because I just need to actually make this, uh, you know, keep these resources for my own industries. And you guys in the United States are going to get less of them. You guys in Europe are going to get less of them. So the invisible hands of the markets doesn't work. WTO rules don't work the way they used to. And in this world, the mindset, the paradigm is changing. And in this world, countries in the West are reacting. And if I want to make a comparison between Europe and the United States, both countries have been reacting to this. In Europe, we've been reacting for the last few years because clean cars, electric vehicles, jobs, green jobs in the gigafactories are at stake. Millions of jobs that we may lose because we sell in Europe. In 2035, we're not going to sell any new car which is not 100% electric. That means that it's a huge change, it's a huge shift in the way we consume, in the way we move. But we need so many of these resources to make a battery of a car. A battery of a car is like 100, 200, 3, 4, 5, 6, 700 kilograms. So we need resources. And we started to react that if we don't have the resources, we're not going to be able to actually have the gigafactories on our ground, and we're not going to have the green jobs. So we reacted in that direction due to this specific reaction, to this specific technology. It's different in the United States. The reaction came because of the F-35. So fascinating story. There's one magnet of rare earths, the same that you have in your pocket with the neodymium, this is a rare earth, which is used, it's a bit bigger, but not that bigger, in the F-35. And there was no way, and there is still today, no way for the United States to get these magnets from any other country but China. And Donald Trump reacted in 2007, I think, 18, in a, in a, in a, in a commercial war, in a trade war with China, as you know, the United States tried to limit the access of China to the US chips, which are you know, the best quality chips. But actually, in return, China was starting to say, OK, I'm going to stop exporting my rivers and other resources, which are needed for most of them, for your ships. That was like you know, retaliation coming from China. And Donald Trump didn't like that. And he said, all right, we have to look at that. And the rivers and other critical minerals for defense technologies, clean technologies, IT technologies suddenly came into the radar of the political circles in DC, which had never happened before. None under the Bush era, none under the Obama era, because of the needs for metals for this specific F-35, and more generally for the defense technologies. So countries and the United States are starting to react due more to national security concerns, which doesn't mean that it's an important thing, because Joe Biden has been just exactly doing the same as Donald Trump has been doing. It is accelerating the policy of securing the access to, to critical resources for the United States, for all the needs of the United States for these resources, including for the electric cars. But let's go into what's being done right now. 
and I have 20 minutes to talk to you about how the West and how the United States react, how the European Union reacts, and try to make some comparison of the diversity of the reaction between both blocks, the United States on one hand and Europe on the other. First, review vulnerabilities in the critical materials supply chains. Hence appears the word critical. I didn't define this word before. Critical means that due to the fact that these resources are being produced one in one specific country, if this country says, I stop producing or I stop exporting, there is no alternative. There is no plan B. That doesn't mean that these resources are only you know, located from a strict geological standpoint in this country. China doesn't have all the railroads. DRC doesn't have all the cobalt. Chile doesn't have all the copper. That just means that because we just didn't want to get dirty, we just let other countries do the dirty job. And that's why sometimes the concentration of the extraction and refining of these resources is specifically in one country. We could diversify, we could find them everywhere, but we just let one country do the job. But if we depend on one person, if there's a strike, if there's a earthquake, if there's a hurricane, or if someone says, oh, I'm going to just stop exporting because we're at war with this other country, it becomes critical because there is no alternative, there is no plan B. And all these resources in Europe, 34, are considered as being critical. All these resources have been made for your phones. And the United States has been doing the same. And what they did is uh, establish in 2022, they're all critical minerals list. There are 50. 50 is huge. I mean, the IT transition is just dying. We're just leaving the first uh, uh, the, the first uh, first decades of the IT uh, revolution and the clean energy revolution hasn't, hasn't even been started and there are already 50 minerals which in the United States are being considered as critical but if you want to act, first what you have to do is well, know where you have to act know where, to, where you have to prioritize and actually you have to prioritize all of these resources in the United States so, then comes the question of the mining diplomacy uh, there is a word which has been touted in, touted in the air for the last four years, coming from the United States. It's French shoring. You may have heard about it. So basically, not offshoring uh, off the, uh, you know, the, the resources from other countries, uh, letting other countries extract, but making sure we can get these resources back. But French shoring means making sure that these countries are friends. Like we're going to make sure that if uh, one country produces a cover for us. Uh, there's not going to be any problems uh, of exports. So this is what we call French sharing. And one thing which has been very interesting in the United States being developed uh, that was last year or the year before, 18 months ago, is a mineral security partnership. This is a, an, a, 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 a dynamics uh, which comes from uh, the uh, Department of State and that brings around the table um, uh, stakeholders, I think there are 14 stakeholders, uh, mining countries and, produ and, and client countries. So the client countries are the United States, Europe. Mining countries are DRC, Tanzania, Zambia. And basically, the country is trying to come all around the table and to say, what is what you can produce to us and what is what I can get from you? And how do we work on a level playing field so that we make sure that we can extract, you can extract these, these resources for us and we re extract in a way that is acceptable for the environment. So there is a lot of level playing field for client countries which will not compete under certain rules, certain ESG rules, environmental, social, governance rules, so that the rights of the people, the rights of the environment in the mining countries can be respected. And this is a US uh, policy that uh, has uh, brought around the table once again 14 stakeholders. And as of yesterday, and I was checking the latest figures, there were already 15 agreements being passed within this mineral security partnership. The thing is, many countries say, hmm, maybe we want to sell you these resources, or we want to have more money out of the resources. DRC uh, officials for last year have been wanting to multiply the tax revenues from the mining of cobalt, saying, we've made enough concessions, which means you guys in the West have made the most of our resources for a while. That's what we call colonization. And because we are getting more important, we, mining countries, in this new IT age, with all the needs for these resources, we want you to pay more for these resources. So the, we hear that message coming from the developing world. We hear another message coming from just Mexico. President Obrador uh, said recently, 
uh, we're going to nationalize all the lithium we have in our ground. Lithium, which both foreign corporations and governments lust, lust after, will belong to Mexico. So you can get access to my lithium, but you're going to pay a big price because I'm going to nationalize first everything. And we hear a third message coming from a very interesting country, which is Indonesia. Actually, uh, the Ministry uh, of Transport of Indonesia said, we must get all of the upstream industry. We want to make the components here in Indonesia. What I mean is, what he means is, uh, we won't, don't want to sell just the nickel raw. We want to process everything here in Indonesia. And we're, we're going to sell you the refined products which, all, which actually is 10 times more uh, expensive than the price of the non-processed product. And uh, when Tesla, when um, Elon Musk, he's a good friend with Widodo, with, with the former president since, since last week, he was, as you may know, there have been general elections last week. But Widodo, uh, he's a good friend. I, they see each other with, 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 uh, with, uh, with Elon Musk. And Elon Musk says, I need your nickel. I need your nickel because uh, Tesla needs nickel for its batteries. Uh, Elon Musk calls nickel spice. He says, I, I need spice. George Herbert, you spice. He needs his spice, and the spice is nickel. And we don't reply, but I, I need you to build a, a, a giga factory on my territory. So on one hand, you need my resources, which you will have. On the other, I want to go down the value chain. I want to get richer. I don't want to be just a mining state. I want to be a, 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 a natural state. I want to be one of the states which produce batteries of your phones, of your cars. And I want to get rich myself, and I want to create high added value jobs. So you start to see like a, a deal which is suggested by the developing world, saying we can exchange our resources against your know-how, against your technologies. So the mining diplomacy of the United States come against, comes against this background of renewed relations, of a renewed balance of power between the West and the rest of the world. What can we be done in terms of extractive revolver in the United States? Well, this is a map, there could be hundreds of maps like this, which shows all the various resources that we can find in the United States. We find everywhere, everything in the United States. And as you may know, there are lithium, there is lithium, uh, there is uh, antimony. I talk about some resources which have been under the spot recently in the media in the United States because you no know, countries, and especially the United States, are talking about extracting from their own on showing the resources to actually be able to, to, to develop the IT transition. So I wouldn't go too much into the details because I have not sufficient time, but just to tell you that there could be an extractive revolver in the United States. And for example, we could reopen, it's been reopened, a very fascinating mine, which is actually located in California, at the border with, in the Utah desert. And this mine is called the Mountain Pass Mine. It's a mine of rare earths. The neodymium in your pocket that makes your phone vibrate is made of uh, its rare earths, and these rare earths may come tomorrow in the future from this mine in the middle of the desert. This mine was closed back into uh, the beginning of the 20th, 21st century, but it's been reopened recently because the United States don't want to just depend upon the rare earths from China. So they have restarted, relaunched the production of this resource, and they extract thousands of tons of ore every every year for the production of the US. The problem is that they don't have the refinery. So what do they do? Well, they sell, uh, they sell they send the rare earths being refined in China, because China is the only country to have the, the refinery. So it's good to have the mine, but if you don't have the refinery, if you don't have the magnet processing facility, you're still not uh, completely uh, sovereign. So as you see, the United States have to go down the value chain, reopen refineries, reopen magnet facilities, and the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, is just working on that right now in order to produce, again, from the beginning to the end of the process, the rare earths, and to produce the magnets. But this mine today is a very interesting example, a symbol of how mining is coming back on the US territory. The thing is, people have to agree. And this picture has been taken a couple of years ago in Alaska, uh, and it's about the Peeble mine in the southwest of Alaska. It's a gold, copper, and molybdenum mine, and basically it could have taken place uh, in a salmon, close to a salmon river. And people were complaining that 
you don't want to actually, you know, endanger, threaten the wildlife for having access to copper and to gold. So the question of having local populations agreeing with a project is something very hard. You can have the resource on your ground, but if people around, if communities disagree, what do you do? So that's a big issue. And today the situation is the same situation for Europe, is to be able to convince the local populations that you can go towards a cleaner world, towards a more dematerialized world, and being actually also uh, uh, eco-friendly in the mining practices. So this is a huge issue which needs to be addressed in the future. But obviously it's a good solution to ensure the pollution of these resources. And I just want to give you one example of lithium. The CO2 production, the, the emissions of CO2 in the air for refining the lithium, whether you refine and produce lithium in the West or in developing countries, well, the ratio is one to three. So you emit three times less CO2 in a, in a developed country, whereas the electricity mix is much more clean, much more less CO2 emitting, than if you do this in China or Indonesia. So relocating the mining processing, the mining facilities in the West, in the United States, in Europe, may, may, may be actually a good thing for the environment. Much better than if we just close our eyes and let the Chinese do emitting as much CO2 as they want. So this needs to be taken into consideration. What about going to the Pacific? What about ocean money? Oh, you disagree. Why? Because it's terrible. It's detrimental to the, like, the, it's very detrimental to the ocean environment and the entire body of water that it, it's located. That's a huge debate. Because people say, well, you know, we need these phones. We need these electric cars. So if you want to have, if you want to be green, if you want to be dematerialized, why not taking these little bowls 5,000 meters deep? and actually process them, and we have to have the wells of resources. And on the other hand, there are many people saying what you're saying, saying but actually we run the risk of aggravating you know, the, 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 the impact of the humans on the environment. So that's a debate which has just been taking place over the last year or so. You might have heard about it because there is a Canadian company, it's a metals company, TMC, which wants to extract the polymetallic uh, nodules from the Pacific. Here are the nodules. And here are the machines, which could go 5,000 meters deep in order to get the resource back to uh, the ground. So this is a huge debate, and I'd love to discuss more with you if you have time, what you think about this. But obviously, ocean mining is in the air. Yes? Um, what do you think that is more contaminated? the CO2 emissions or the excavation for lithium? It's a very good question. And it would take me two hours to answer. Mm -hmm. So long story short, we look at CO2 emissions as one of the, as if it was the only criteria for, um, for uh, what we do. But there is much more than CO2. Uh, mining is about polluting the earth. It's about polluting the waters. It's about artificialization, artificialization of the grounds. It's about uh, biodiversity. Uh, there is, an, there is a, uh, obviously a threat to biodiversity. So there are many other criteria that need to be taken into consideration in order to, look, to see whether this is good or bad, not only CO2. Regarding mining, it's uh, probably less CO2 emitting and the, because uh, the, the, the nodules are very concentrated. So you need to refine less in order to get more of the metals from the nodules. So the refining will be less energy intensive, so less CO2 emitting. But what kind of damages do you do 5,000 meters deep? And the reality is no one knows. Because actually you bring back the sediments to the, to the column of water, uh, and then it has to go down to the seabed, and it might take years before all the sediments you know, are going back to where they come from. And we don't have an idea on the, uh, you know, what it means in terms of uh, impact for that biodiversity. So many, uh, many uh, researchers today are saying, scientists are saying, because we don't know, we first need to know. We first need to assess the real impact. And then when we will know, maybe we do. But at least, you know, let's have first the knowledge before we do anything. That's the only answer I can give to you right now. It's just there is so much unknown around this. But the impact might be important, but there's a debate. Uh, 
it's an interesting place where to look at the Indian Ocean, but also uh, the Clario Cupertone zone uh, in the, the North Pacific. Uh, so this is basically where such extracting could take place. Uh, it's about in the United States opening gigafactories. So I will not go much more deep into this uh, uh, graph because I don't want to take too much time. But there are dozens of uh, gigafactories, uh, uh, you know, uh, being opening, and also projects of gigafactories all around the United States. Is there U.S. gigafactories or European gigafactories? Uh, uh, Japanese gigafactories uh, actually for accelerating uh, the development of the battery in order to uh, to um, to um, to, uh, to catch up the delay uh, to uh, to China and uh, also strategic stockpiling. This is a very fascinating uh, actually uh, development in the United States. Uh, just uh, I would just like to let you know that uh, stockpiling of critical minerals is important for the defense industry in the United States. That there is a national defense stockpile which owns minerals for a value which is, I think, something around 20, 24 billions of dollars worth of minerals. So, in case there is a, like, suddenly, you know, the export of some minerals completely stops, the United States have some, some stocks in order to make sure that uh, they can uh, go on uh, with uh, their stocks for the next 30 or 60 days. And these uh, minerals. The United States used, used to have them. They used to have a stockpile during the, war, the Cold War. But after the Cold War, they just gained the peace dividends. So basically, they said, oh, there's no war anymore. So we don't use this resource anymore because uh, we can just sell them and we can get money and we can use this money to develop Pentagon programs. So everything was just sold until the moment, and that is the case today in the United States, where resources in the, in the, in the defense stockpile can't be sold anymore. We don't have the rights. So you see that there is a reverse uh, 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 politics now in this regard. Uh, what about research for new materials? Why do we believe that the battery will be just made out of lithium? Maybe your batteries in the future will be made out of any different resources. And there are many chemical, uh, you know, which uh, many chemi chemistry uh, researchers in this regard, even in the United States. Uh, batteries could become, become batteries of sodium, out of sodium rather than lithium. And sodium is a very abundant mineral in the earth. We could develop other batteries such as lithium sulfur or lithium iron phosphates, which is a Chinese, uh, which is a technology which is being used by the Chinese. And maybe waste from the food could tomorrow become actually a resource for the batteries. It's been tested today in laboratories. It's not upscaled. It's not uh, developed at the industrial level. I'm not uh, a dreamer. I'm not saying that this is going to come into your pocket tomorrow, but researchers is going into that direction. And also this facility to look at which resources will be, you know, strategic tomorrow. Maybe food waste and all the waste in general will be strategic because we know what to make out of them. And maybe, you know, the solution of tomorrow is a criticality of the solution of today, could be the criticality of tomorrow. I'll give you just an example, a fascinating one. Uh, uh, these batteries are made of phosphates, so they replace nickel and cobalt. No need for nickel, no need for cobalt. Oh, we can. We don't have to go back to Indonesia or DRC for getting these resources. We're going to replace them with iron and phosphates. Phosphates is one of the key ingredients for um, uh, les fertilizers. Fertilizers. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's been produced by Morocco. It's already a critical resource. So, what will we do tomorrow? Will we use phosphates for eating or for drying? No, that's a question which could actually be you know, brought to us in the future if phosphates is being more and more used. I'm not sure, but I just want to raise the question that it's not because you find a solution tomorrow that it doesn't become a, that it doesn't become a problem after all. So let's keep that into consideration. And I'll just finish before wrapping up and I'll be on time with a circular economy. Because today, the, you know, we live in a metals world. More and more resources will, be, will have to be extracted from the ground. The good news compared to CO2 is that when you burn CO2, you don't recycle the CO2 which is in the atmosphere, right? The good news is that you can recycle the metals. It's here. It's in my phone. So what about recycling these resources and reusing as much as you can 
the battery, the metal single battery, to actually manufacture another battery. If we develop this circular world, we can use less and less resources because more and more of what you consume every day will come from secondary sources, which means a recycler, rather than primary sources, which come from the mine. And we can maybe attain the goal of having a, a low carbon world and a low metals world. Maybe we can do so. But that means developing the circular economy, which is a key important revolution coming ahead. And uh, obviously, it's today hard to recycle the metals on your phone. All you see in red is what is recycled less than 10% or less than 1%. Such as, so yeah, there are things that you recycle very well. You can recycle very well copper, uh, nickel, cobalt, uh, manganese. Uh, uh, but there are resources that you recycle not very well. So neodymium of your phone is not recycled because it's mixed into your phone with other resources. So if you want to reuse it, you have to separate all the resources and then you have to make another magnet out of the, of the first magnet. It's very difficult to do. It's so expensive that actually it's less expensive to go back to the mine. So there is no business model for recycling today. So basically it's going to be, it's, it's still difficult today to recycle many resources such as lithium, gallium and germanium which are used into the ship of your phone, the microprocessor, but also all these rivers which are on the last line here, including the neodymium, that was just examples of these resources which are not being re uh, uh, recycled today or very badly recycled. And circular economy is about recycling, as you can see. It is the final step, but before the final step, you have all the other steps of the recycling economy, of the circular economy, which is about uh, producing in a better manner, so going mining but in a proper way, you use less water in the mining, you recycle the, the water from the mining, so that it's already recycling the resource. Uh, that seeds that come from the less cost of the environment. Designing your phones in a sustainable way. Your phone, my phone, is not designed in a sustainable way. It's not designed to be recycled. It's designed to be thrown away within 18 months. And what if you think about your phone in a way that makes it recyclable, so that there is a work for a recycler five years later? These things need to be taken into consideration. What about collecting? Because my phone, when it's dead, remains in my place. I don't go bring it back to the, to, the, to, the, to the garbage because I'm afraid that my data may be actually taken away. But how do we make it so that we can organize the collection of this waste and to bring this waste back to places where the volumes might be sufficient in order to recycle at a cost which is competitive comparing to the cost of the mining and eventually the recycling, and that is good for the environment because that helps reduce the CO2 emission of the production. It's not only about CO2 as I explained to you, but it's important. So recycling means that the secondary material is more interesting for the environment, less impactful than the primary uh, material. If I just want to sum it up, because I was asked for the two last minutes to make a comparison between what the United States do and what Europe do. I would just say that the critical material topic was completely forgotten by both the United States and Europe for a while. It was, you know, deindustrialization. It was a peace dividends. Nobody in both these two blocks wanted to take care of this. It has changed, I would say, about five to six years ago for different reasons that I explained. It's changed in Europe because we realized that these resources were important for energy vehicles. And it's changed in the United States first because of the needs of your defense industry. So you see the awakening came for different purposes. I think the reaction in the United States is stronger than the reaction in Europe today in terms of critical minerals policy. The mining diplomacy of the United States is stronger, even if the US, the European policy does exist too. And also, the United States are much stronger in terms of strategic stocks. We still discuss in Europe about whether we should organize uh, among the continent, among the countries of the European Union, a strategic stock of critical minerals. The United States have already been doing this for a while. So I see a stronger reaction in this regard. I think in terms of circular economy, the EU is better than in the US. We have developed a battery regulation, which says we must recycle what we use, and we must reuse what we recycle. So in the future batteries, we need to feature in the future batteries a certain percentage of resources which, which come from the recycling plant, not from the mine. And in this regard, and in terms also of a fair sourcing of resources from the mine, I think Europe is better. 
there is a strong willingness from the United States to exclude China from the market, from their markets. And uh, I could develop that in the questions if you want. Much stronger, in my view, than from the, uh, on the European side. And to finish, EU and US interests may converge. This is the mineral security partnership which I talked about. Because the EU and the US are working together to find a common level playing field. So this interest may converge. We also sometimes have the same trade partners. Think about Australia and Canada, which are producing these resources. Uh, it's resources which have an interest for the US and for Europe. We have the same trade partners. Such interests may actually, uh, in, uh, between the US and the EU, may be different. And the challenges may be different. We in Europe have specific problems with resources that the United States don't have. I just take the example, fascinating example of titanium. Titanium is necessary for planes. It's a metal that is lighter than steel, and more today, 15% of the weight of a plane is made of titanium. Titanium, for European needs, comes from Russia. And we cannot have any other solution than getting this freaking titanium from Russia. This is going to be a problem. Everyone knows that, but we don't know how to do it. The United States, they sold their titanium through a lot of other partners, the Japanese. So they have not the same issues as you can see. And just to finish, our interest with the US compared to the EU may compete. We may be in competition, I and mean, we will be in this mining space in competition over cobalt, over nickel, over copper. Why? Because it's not sure we're going to mine sufficiently for everyone's needs. The mining world is, faces a paradox. On the one hand, there is so much demand coming in the future. On the other hand, mining is, has no good reputation. So the mining world actually doesn't want to mine more or to develop more mining in the long term and short term, medium term, than what it could because the reputation is bad and because the press is bad, the media is bad, the media coverage. So we are coming into a situation where if we don't find the substitutes, the new materials, we may have some lacks of resources. In copper, cobalt, for example, the copper is very much identified as being a metal where there could be some uh, actually uh, discrepancy between the demand and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the supply. And if we come to such a situation, our interest will compete. We will fight for, this, for having the, the same resources of copper coming from a few countries. And we are in a change of paradigm, in a shift of paradigm, where the balance of power between the mining countries and the client countries is changing. For a while, the client was the key. It's not true anymore. When you are one of the very few mining countries able to produce a resource, and when you have many clients rushing to get your resource, what do you do? Well, you start to, you know, being difficult. You start to say, to, 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 to ask for more, more money. And you start to actually organize a competition between the client countries. And in this world where we might face some shortages, I said we might, because I'm not sure, the EU and the US could compete, obviously, uh, against this backdrop of uh, uh, shifting of balance of power between many countries and high countries. I've been a bit longer than expected, but I will, tr I will try to do my best because we started a bit late. Thank you for your attention. I just talked about it for an hour. It's too short. We could speak for more about it, but we have some time for questions. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I mentioned you were a filmmaker. You said you also make documentaries. I did. I, I did a documentary on this, on this, uh, which is entitled uh, "The Dark Side of Green Energies." Gotcha. Uh, okay. You might find it on Amazon. On Amazon. Uh, Amazon. The dark side of green energies. Of green energies. So you, all that you see here, I've filmed it. And when I'm talking to you about this, it's mostly places where I've been myself, like physically speaking. Yes. I don't know if you might have already discussed this in your book about the documentary or the book, The Dark Side of Green Energies. If I discuss what? That's a documentary or a book? Both. But a book. You, you, you can start with documentary. It's a one hour documentary. Like you've written a lot about this in The Dark Side of Green Energies, but as you had mentioned, um, the IT world is trying to be cleaner, and I don't think that there is a future where the IT world can actually be clean because a lot of these resources come with the cost of blood 
right? So in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the country that you had mentioned, I'm actually from there. I was about to ask you where you were from. Yes. Yeah. A lot of the resources that are used in computers, phones, etc., come from there, but there's currently a genocide that is going on there. That has been going on for the past 30 years, 20 years, and no one has done anything about it. And so if we keep mining, the people are going to continue to die. And the West has made it clear that you know, it doesn't necessarily care about the people that are dying in these mineral-rich countries. And President Biden currently, not currently, but recently had a meeting with President Chisekedi, but the West has a reputation of coming to developing countries, shaking hands with their fingers crossed behind their backs. So I don't think that there's actually going to be a revolution where we actually have clean energy, because it's always going to be dirty. Thank you for your, for your comments. I won't add anything to it. <laughs> it's good to, to share. Uh, if you want to go further than that, well, there is uh, the book that I've written, and also there is a book whose name is Cobalt Red. Well, have you written it? No, it's written by a UK researcher, specifically on DRC, okay. to, to dig into your topic. That's fine. But also, um, you had mentioned that the US is trying to build more mines and etc. but mining also comes with the cost of comfort. And Americans are very, profound about their comfort and they think that it's very important to them. We can see that in the pandemic with people refusing to wear masks just because it hindered their personal freedoms and etc. So I don't think there's ever going to be more mining in the US because it comes with the cost of comfort. But in other countries it comes with the cost of lives. And so that's that's always going to be an imbalance. I do agree. And I think we face we in the West difficult situations uh, where we're going to have to, uh, you know, publicly decide what we do in the face of these growing needs. Because whether we want it or not, and I, I'm pro-IT, pro-clean, green technologies, but we're going to have to get this money from somewhere. So who's going to extract it? And uh, if we want to take our responsibilities, we're going to have to extract it ourselves. And this debate is coming in Europe, it's coming in the United States. It's going to be tough. Thank you.